Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, my name is Mo Morsi. Um, I am here today to talk to you about the Syracuse Innovators Guild, which was uh, Syracuse, New York's first hackerspace. Um, you know, hackerspaces, makerspaces, I'm assuming most of everyone in here is familiar with them, if anyone's not familiar. It's essentially just a kind of a, a community operated space where people come together, work on projects, um, you know socialize, have fun, you know, the idea is to reach out to the communities to express the interest in tech topics and all sorts of things. So I'm here today to talk about the history of our group, where we came, where we went, and um, so on and so forth. So uh, the Syracuse Innovators Guild started in 2010. Uh, it was just really a bunch of people in the local community. We uh, started, we, our founder posted a Craigslist of all places. Uh, he, I don't know why he chose Craigslist, to tell you the honest truth. Um, I've, I had found out about it. I saw the post when I uh, was looking for a new apartment, so it was a really random thing for me. Um, you know, I emailed the guy. Uh, we all started meeting up at coffee shops. Uh, restaurants, bars, just trying to drive some momentum. Uh, it was just a really uh, a rough concept in the early days, but you know we had uh, formed we had formed enough um, interest to uh, we felt that it was right to incorporate. Um, we, you know, one of the early things that I've quickly found out about, and that. Um, I wanted to kind of convey in a group like this is that, you know, there's a balance that's needed in whatever endeavor that you do. Uh, I don't know, I mean, everyone here has heard about Makerspace, but is, is anyone here, I guess, involved in organizing a group like this? Or, uh, yeah, uh, there's a couple uh, <laughs> former organizers of the guild here, uh, but anyone that runs a let's say a small group at your local university, or, um, okay, that's fine. Uh, well, you know, the challenge behind a group, something like this, is that when you're trying to drive interest in any particular topic, is you want to not take on too much burden, but you also want to show commitment. So, you know, during the early days, we decided to uh, form a group that would, we did have, uh, I guess, I don't want to say burdens, but we did have expenses, we did have things that we had to pay for as far as a, an operating space, a machines, tools, people's time, but, you know, we also wanted to keep those minimal. Um, and thus, it's, we kind of failed in that effort. Uh, long story short, the group did get as far as formally incorporating, uh, adopting a home, but as you can see here, the group only exists now as kind of this virtual entity. Uh, the, and a couple years ago, we had to shut our doors down because we kind of jumped too, uh, too quick too soon. Uh, we took way too many financial responsibilities on early on, and due to various mistakes that we made, uh, the group did, wasn't able to pay its bills. So I'm going to talk about a couple of those, but as it stands today, the group exists as a 501c3, a fully uh, a nonprofit at the federal level, but we don't have an actual physical space to show. So how did we get there? Well, as I mentioned, the group was founded in 2010. Our founder posted a Craigslist. I personally saw it, a few of our other members sitting up here uh, saw it by a meetup. Um, meetup is, was one of the best resources that our group could use. It essentially allows us to get the word out very easily, very quickly. Uh, it provided us a lot of tools that we uh, were able to quickly leverage to show, show what was happening and where. So I personally thought meetup was a great, adopt, uh, great tool. If you, if you have a group like this, I really encourage you to adopt Meetup because um, it's, it's cheap and it's, it allows you to get the word out. So here I collected some aggregate statistics for our, for our group. Uh, oh, this is over the, the whole lifetime of it. 
On the left, you can see the meetups by calendar month, um, and on uh, the upper left, uh, and on the lower left, you see the number of attendees by specific calendar month, and on the right, you see the aggregate meetups. Now, unfortunately, you know this is the complete picture. I took the every single meetup, I ran the numbers, and this is what the group did. Now, I have to uh, say that. You know, some things that the group did weren't done through Meetup, and, uh, you know, for example, some people that signed up by Meetup didn't show up, and vice versa. So, this maybe encapsulates 90% of it. There's things that happen with this group outside of it. They also have other Meetups. They have other, like, the Bitcoin. And there's other, there's other, there's that's, other, that's Ethereum as well. That's true. So, there was a lot of different groups in the Syracuse community that was using our space for uh, various purposes. Um, you know... I was hoping that this, uh, these graphs show, would show uh, us a little bit more as to why the group you know, succeeded or didn't, but it really, you know, there isn't a lot of information in these graphs, besides the fact that the group was fairly active during the entire uh, course of its lifetime, right? You can see that there's only a few gaps in the number of meetups but it, you know, per month, uh, but even that being said, you know, the group was, the space was being used during that time. So, uh, you know, just because there wasn't a formal meetup doesn't mean that people weren't in the space and, uh, you know, working on projects, socializing and whatnot. Um, also on the left, or on the right, excuse me, you know, there really isn't, wasn't a particular time of year that was more conducive to hacking. You know, maybe you can see here in uh, June and October, there was more attendance, but, you know, I, I don't want to really draw any conclusions. So, again, this just goes to show that the group was active during, you know, the five, the five years that it was operational uh, and it was doing things. Now, here is where the story gets a little bit more interesting. Uh, we see the average attendees by type and topic. Um, on the left, we see a very nice, promising, uh, a picture that looks really good in the sense that workshops, presentations, social events, these uh, accounted for more than half of the things that the group did. So people that came in to visit the guild, they saw that we were doing stuff of value. We were doing, we were uh, working on projects, we were uh, having cool presentations, we were um, you know, having discussions on all sorts of topics, uh, which is great. This is what people come to these sorts of groups for. On the flip side, a really bad uh, part was the fact that the organization was such a large slice. You know, when you come to a group like this, you don't want to see people just doing like kind of the bureaucracy, you know, just talking about how do we make money, how do we, you know, so and so forth. This stuff is necessary, you know, you can't just completely discount it, but, you know, you really require a balance. And I think that's one of the key words that I want to drive in all this. You need a kind of a, a balance in uh, your efforts, um, well, in everything in life, but especially with your efforts like a group like this. You have to provide value, you have to do you know, technical things, presentations and workshops, but you also have to make money. You know, as, as much as we you know, wish we could ignore it, you, know, you have to pay the bills to keep a space open at the end of the day. So, you know, the right balance, in my opinion, would have less on the org side, but you, know, you do have to have some commitment to those uh, type of activities. And plus, you know, I, I think that people can do that work really well is be open, you know, don't be, don't try to um, foster this, oh, you have to be part of this exclusive club to run the group, you're just an attendee. You know, the more that you can reach out to people and say, hey, we need help doing stuff, the more you bring in, the more that you recognize people's account, uh, endeavors in open, uh, you know, very uh, clear manner, the more conducive it will be to people joining your group. So. You know, don't be afraid to discuss what you need and to help, to have, uh, to ask for help. Uh, on the right side, we see uh, a, pro a nice picture. Uh, we see that the group was had a very wide, diverse uh, set of interests. Um, you know, there were there really wasn't any particular topic that was more uh, interesting to others in the Syracuse community. You know, things maybe like crypto, uh, cryptography, and programming, maybe slightly more so than others, but. Um, everything, you know, the group never shuns, sh shunned anyone. We had, we opened our doors. I never encountered any time which someone um, came to the group and said, hey, I was interested in this, and the group said no. So 
I think that was something that the group did really well. So here's a picture from our first home. Uh, we had, there's a few people uh, in this room that you might recognize. Um, you know, we had uh, started meeting in 2010. We incorporated in 2011. We committed our first space in 2012, early 2012. Now, this space was both a curse and a blessing, in my opinion. Uh, I guess the curse part was what I talked about before was that the bills were way too high. You know, we didn't, in my opinion, we didn't do our homework before we uh, moved into our space. Uh, we found a space downtown, which I think was the very first place recommended to us. Um, you know, I, myself included, I didn't, you know, do any uh, hunting uh, as far as properties. We just kind of jumped. It showed commitment. But, you know, we should have jumped into something, a, a smaller boat, <laughs> something that we could have manned. Uh, you know, it was what it was. It, the place has a special, it had a special place in my heart because, you know, it was our first place. You know, we can see, you know, our main uh, area where we worked on projects. So we had a kitchen. We had, on the lower right, uh, a bit of, you know, you see our first wireless, our first internet setup, which is another keynote, always have internet. Uh, you know, you can't survive without it. Is there a question? Or? Oh, you're just, all right, you're stretching. So real quick, I want to just add something on the slide. So that, that access point there was actually operating as a wireless bridge from the building next door. So we weren't actually, at that point, we didn't even have our own internet access. We were piggybacking off of somebody else. But yep. they, they gave us permission, of course. Of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah there was uh, quite a few hacks with this place. I mean, the, uh, the garage, the, the, the parking spot hack, I'm not going to discuss because we may not have permission for that but uh, but well yeah so that was our first space you know uh, yeah downtown as I said parking is that was a big uh, hassle with that but. Uh, yeah one thing that the group did do right during its uh, lifetime was we had a lot of really great presentations and workshops uh, I think this was the kind of the golden star that our group did uh, you know this or the start of the top of our tree, excuse me. Um, you know, on the upper left and the bottom right, you see the Hackers on a Train Tour. Uh, Mitch Altman came to uh, visit all the hacker spaces, well, not all, but a lot of hacker spaces in the country, including Interlock and ours. Uh, you know, here we see a, a little trip we took to Interlock early on. Uh, Interlock's a Rochester hacker space. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Uh, you know, when, one of our organizational meetings early on, uh, Arduino Day, social events, lightning talks. You know, this group, as you saw in the uh, slide, a couple slides ago, it was doing stuff all the time. So, you know, I think this was one of the things that we did best uh, as far as, you know, offering value to the community. And, you know, we were, we were promoting ourselves well and uh, great effort from everyone who was ever, you know, involved in the group as far as uh, that. Uh, we also worked on projects, uh, you know, robots to 3D printers to a, a Bitcoin barbershop pole that would light up whenever Bitcoin would go up and down. The, groups did, uh, the group did things. Um, you know, it may be not as many as, uh, as much emphasis on the projects part as on the uh, presentations, but still things were being done. Though, you know, there were a lot of projects that weren't finished. Um, you know, you can see again, a robot that wasn't finished, a MakerBot. This was more of a problem during the early days. Uh, you know, when we first started going, get, we, when we first got going, uh, you know, people wanted to see, what, what are you doing? What are you, so it was kind of like crickets, you know, and that's, that's really tough, um, it's a tough sell. You know, later on, once we had some stuff uh, under our belt, we were able to, you know, that wasn't as big an issue. Like, oh, hey, check out this cool thing. Or that right there was a giant, uh, you know, keyboard that we were going to, we were building, you know, so you could play rock band with it. It just, it never got finished. Uh, <coughs> you know, you know, I guess that's another point. Um, you know, if you're, if you're running a group like this, if you're involved with a group like this, you're not, you might not necessarily have to finish your projects, but you have, you, I encourage you to get things to a point which you can demonstrate, right? It's, you know, it's embarrassing if you, if you don't have something to show and uh, even if, you know, you have something to be like, it's kind of halfway there, but we can use more help. At least that gives people something to grasp on you. But if you can't finish it, repurpose it. Here you can see the keyboard turned into a coffee table. Uh, you know, this, a lot of stuff came through this group. Um, 
that at first I was like, oh my god, you know, we have so much junk, but I actually kind of kind of liked it over time. It, it kind of added an aesthetic to the space, and you know, we were all the policy was if you brought it to the space, label it if you wanted to keep it. If not, it belongs to the group. Uh, people can use it Those eventually. So what? Goes in the bone yard. Exactly. There we had a discard pile that would you know eventually get sold. So I think if you have a process dealing with stuff like this, it's it's not as big of an issue. So at the end of the day, why didn't we you know succeed? Quote unquote. Well, money. Uh, you know we took on expenses that were uh, not able to uh, that we weren't able to cover with our uh, income. Here you can see this was a chart that was made uh, fairly later on by one of our members. You know you can see that we were at this point we were talking about uh, increasing our dues and they weren't uh, even that it wasn't going to be enough to cover the cost in the long run. So um, you know that's that's kind of the story in one picture, right? But you know uh, that that chart was after um, you know a couple moves. The first place we had was very expensive, so we did find a second place. Uh, kind of you know it was the month we were supposed to leave. But uh, this place, in my opinion, was our our best. I this is my personal my humble opinion. You know we had a green screen room, we had a workshop, we had a server room. It just the group was really happening in in this period during this period. Um, watch out for landlords. You know, I've had every single landlord try to pull shady stuff. Uh, our, our first treasurer is smiling over here. Treasurer is smiling over here. So, <laughs> um, you know, from people having super huge, complicated uh, lease agreements, uh, slipping things into lease agreements, hoping that people won't catch, to holding security deposits. I actually sued our first landlord because he wouldn't give us our security deposit back, which he quickly did after he got there. Um, which in that same vein, I guess my advice on that would it, to be to quote Teddy Roosevelt in the sense that, you know, speak softly, but carry a big stick, you know, be kind to your landlord, be polite, uh, but don't be afraid to, if he ever tried or if he, she, if he or she ever tries something, uh, you know, stand your ground. If they try to pull some shady stuff, be like, no, this is not what we agreed to, um, obviously in a polite way, you know. In almost every city across America, across the world, there's tons of vacant properties, you know, still dealing with the effect of the housing bubble and all that good stuff. So use that to your advantage, you know. Don't be afraid to negotiate rent. Don't be afraid to say, hey, you know, I'm involved with this local community group that we are, uh, we're offering a lot of value to our community. You know, don't you want a group like ours to be in your space? You know, if, it just sit, if you notice the space is sitting empty for a few years, uh, use that as a negotiating point. So unfortunately our landlord in the second space kind of pulled a bait and switch. Uh, the month I think our lease was due, he said, oh, you know, I rented, uh, it was due to renew, I rented your space out to someone else, you know. But incidentally we had this other space, he had this other space that was kind of going unused for a long time and oh, why don't you guys just move in here? Um, you know, it works. You know, I, I, it was more money. It was more money. It was more space. It didn't have heat. Yeah, it didn't yeah. have heat. Half the year we couldn't use it. It's, you know, when it was, it, when it was being used, it was rocking. You know, it was there was a lot of uh, fun events and whatnot. But I, I personally, yeah, yeah, a little, a little bit. But we kind of took a step back because we moved from an area that was too expensive into a, a decent space for us, and then ended up back in the same boat where we were. Once again, paying really more than w what we could what afford. What we could afford, yeah. yeah. And it had it had a lot of potential, um, and we didn't have to like there were there was goods and good uh, good good and bad to it. So we had um, no electric. Uh, we didn't have to pay for electric, right? It was included, so we could run space heaters, <laughs> right? Um, it still it was still cold in the winter time, but you know so but all of our IT stuff that was running, you know, we even joked about you know setting up Bitcoin mining in there because we weren't paying for electricity, which we didn't do, but um, there was, yeah. it, it, it definitely, um, it, you know, but it definitely, what happened was that we, you know, as a group, um, and this uh, was the last, I came in in the second space is when I joined the group. Um, so what, as a, collectively as a group, what we didn't learn was from that first space to the second space, how much of a burden had been lifted off of us uh, rent-wise. Yeah. Well, geez, Bitcoin mining would have uh, helped with a heating problem. 
Yeah, yeah no, all right. And maybe paid the bills. They could have paid the bills too. Yeah. <laughs> Three birds with one stone. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's a good point. I think that um, you know coordinating efforts, you know, is very important with a group like this. It's a lot of people put a lot of hard work into this. Uh, you know, I, I think that was one of the biggest uh, travesties, you know, tragedies uh, that uh, I, I kind of was reflecting upon that. It's like, how did the group get to this point after putting so much uh, time and dedication and manpower, but um, you know, part of it was not coordination, part of it was, again, just some mistakes with finance, financial finances and so on and so forth. And, and Mo, if I could add, also I think that there was a big difference in vision. So. Some people felt that really the wood shop was like the best thing, right? And the fact that this this space had lots of room and we had uh, we had a really large wood shop, you know, table saw the whole thing. That that was the best, you know, that was the best piece of it. We had an electronics workstation and everything had its place, whereas the previous building everything was kind of tight. Um, and then other folks felt that you know the space really should have been better heated and needed to look more professional. Um, so what we had was people's visions were kind of playing out in this uh, in this collage, rather than having a a, um, a vision that everyone was behind to support. We ended up with <coughs> lots of visions, and um, and I think that fractured the group in a lot of ways. Yeah, I I, I agree with that, but I also disagree, and yeah, I would love to sure. hear people's thoughts. Um, you know, I yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean. You want diversity and synergy, and I think this goes back to what I said about balance before. It's you want to reach out, to be able to reach out to a lot of different people, but at the same time, yes, you can't do everything all the time, so you have to kind of focus efforts. It's tough. It's tough. You know, it's, I'm sure people that are maybe not involved, not, maybe you're not even involved in organizing group, but if you're just a participant or an observer, then you know you might see this, some of these things that. You have meetings which everyone's talking, but nothing seems to be getting done. Or, uh, you know, you have someone that's doing a good job on something, but it's not being recognized. You know, every little one of these things that you know you can address and that you can try to solve a little bit, even you know if you don't solve the big picture, goes to a long way to help these sorts of groups, especially in its um, you know incantation in these early days. Well, here we see a kind of a more stark picture, uh, you know, kind of the ultimate reason why the group had to shut its doors. You know, things like rent, uh, utilities, internet, they add up and it's not cheap. Um, so every dime, you, every penny you can save, the better. Uh, don't be stingy. You know, there's, again, that balance that you need to be made, you know. Look to look for innov innovative ways to repurpose the, the tools and resources you have. You know, we took you know, a lot of the old computers that we that were donated, you know, mixed and matched parts, build a computer lab. Uh, but don't be afraid to spend money on things to show that, you know, buy 3D printers, buy, you know, stuff you need for workshops and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, inevitable, uh, in 2015, two years ago, we shut the door, or the, la the doors of our last space, which you just saw. Uh, the group had a fire sale. We decided, you know, the interest wasn't there to uh, continue operations, at least for the time being. But, you know, who knows? Maybe uh, the group can spring to life again. Um, it's, it's in cold storage, you know. All the stuff is in, you know, in people's houses. The community is still there. I was talking to Mark outside, you know, circumstances would have to be right. It would, have, it would take a lot, I'm not denying it, but it could happen. So that's where it stands. Uh, the Syracuse hackerspace does exist on paper, uh, but you know, don't jump in over, get in over your heads. I think that's one of the biggest things. And question? There was, I think there was a question. What, first, first one here? Yeah. Sure. Uh, so what would, taking this post forum, especially you guys' insider knowledge, what are your suggestions for uh, especially the budgetary ideas for this for organizations like this do you think you know they should start utilizing cheap public spaces like libraries and build some sort of like endowment and then move into spaces or like what what do you think is a good strategy um yeah i mean i'd love to hear other people's thoughts but the more you can piggyback on other people great you know if you have some place someone that can offer a space for free you, you're, you're really cutting a huge expense out of your uh 
what, what you need to pay. Uh, be careful with the endowments and the grants and stuff like that. Uh, you know, we, as I mentioned before, we went the nonprofit route, uh, and various people will attest to whether that's good or, or bad. Uh, I'm looking at First Treasurer because uh, Chris here, he he, uh, he raised some good of yeah, so we ran yeah. into some issues with where to get money from as, as a nonprofit. Yeah. But also, one of the other issues, financial, was there was this mentality of if we build it, they will come. Yeah. Um, so there was this over optimistic sort of view of, oh, okay, well, once we get our space, then more members will join and they'll all give us, you know, $100 a month or whatever. You know, some. Um, <coughs> did not, now, in certain cities, that might be doable. In Syracuse, with its strange sort of dynamic, you know, economic issues, um, it was may not have been realistic. Yeah, I think a key thing is don't overcommit yourself up front. I mean, we started off with you know less income than expenses, so it was from day one we're like, okay, who's gonna throw an extra money this month, and the next month, and the next month, and so make sure you're you're not overextending yourselves like that. Make sure you're budgeting wisely. And if you can try to save money, you know. And I would I would say too that you have to ask yourself why. Why do we need the space? Do we really have a reason? Is there any reason that we can't meet at the library? So if you're if you're grassrootsing, you know, if you're if you're you got a grassroots movement and you're trying to build something, then I think using a local library that has a space, like for example, we have Fayetteville that has three D printers. Uh, more than you know, we ever had. But that didn't exist when it we didn't, started. It didn't. It didn't. You know, but today, uh, if we were going to do it again, I would be in favor of like using that space for as long as we could until we absolutely grew out of it and needed something else. You know, not just ego, not like oh, we have our own space, but needed. There were there a couple There's other questions. Yeah. Go ahead. So, um, multiple roles of director and Raising member dues. Like, we haven't raised our member dues since the vote has been that year, right? And it causes budgetary constraints. Yep. Not that we're massively facing them, but one of the things that I always argue is we should have some uproll over time, you know. Uh, what was your guys' um, you talked about that in one of your slides this week. What was I don't know how much you charge for your member dues, so I don't know what the limit was to begin with. But what was the negative feedback? Why is it that to, to increase in the dues? Yeah, you increase the dues. Yeah, I think, you know, you, it, the general uh, philosophy is if you increase dues, you have to increase value, right? I mean, right. people people who are paying the current dues, they're, they're paying because they get that, you know, they feel like the value they got out of the space, uh, you know, that's offset by that. But, you know, if they're being asked to pay more dues, well, why should I, you know? But, well, I yeah. And, and we were we were also looking. To, we were very optimistic in that we were going to be able to pull in new members. Right. So there was um, there was definitely a disagreement, pretty violent disagreement at times, okay. over whether or, you know if we raise the dues, is that going to make it harder for us to attract new members? Gotcha. So we you know, and it wasn't that it was very expensive, but we just you know we're trying to understand why we would get good turnouts at our meetups, but we wouldn't have really necessarily a really good conversion rate. Sure. Right. Okay. It wasn't super expensive, but it was, you know, yeah. everything. I mean, we counts. did try other options besides raising dues. We also tried to lower dues at one point to hopefully encourage more people to join. It, it did a little, but it didn't have the net effect in the end of what we needed. Sure. I think you probably have time for some stuff. Yeah, question. yeah, we have like a minute left. Um, so I live in the Syracuse area. Okay. And I think I saw one news story on you guys at like when you just first opened, and that was all I ever heard about. Uh, sure. And um, so, what kind of things are you guys doing? What were you doing to get people to come in that maybe hadn't heard of you before? Uh, like I said, our main outreach thing was Meetup. We had we hit all the social networks: Facebook, uh, Twitter, so on and so forth. We did reach out to the newspapers. I mean, that was something you know. Not frequently. I think we could have used more press releases potentially. Uh, uh, from my opinion, I think I, I was pushing for that at one point, but I, it never really happened. But I think it could have pushed a little more interest. I want to dispute not frequently though, because early on, like you know, at least I know for, I was constantly every event uh, <laughs> reaching out to you know sending things to the papers. So uh, yeah, just you know, also you know, virally, you know, so. I felt like that was a front that 
yeah, maybe there was things that we could have improved, but there's a lot of things that we did everything that we could have, you know, like presentations and, and outreach. Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, money was the big thing and not, like Mark said, not jumping into that huge financial commitment, the group probably would still be around. Um, so balance, balance people, you know, that's, that's what it takes. All right, thanks for coming, everyone.